Hello, everyone. We're so excited to have you here with us tonight. I'm Steve Siebersod, Advancement Communications Manager here at Binghamton University. On behalf of the Alumni Association, I would like to welcome you to this very special event, an evening with Rick Steves. And very pleased to have and like to extend a warm welcome and very happy to have him as part of the Binghamton University family for tonight. Rick Steves. Rick, thank you so much for, for being with us here. Oh, it's great to be with you, Steve. Thank you. Well, we hope the video that all of us just saw served to get you excited, to get you pumped up for this event. Uh, over the next hour, Rick and I are going to have a conversation, a question and answer session on why we travel and some of these themes and some of these ideas were talked about in the video that we just saw. So if you have questions and we would love to get your questions into the mix, feel free to type them into the comment box. If you're watching us on the microsite, uh, you can add it to the comment box and you can add these on comments on Facebook if you're watching us on the Alumni Association Facebook page. So get those questions in. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can over the next hour. We can go a little bit over an hour if uh, the energy is uh, uh, good for the session. Also, I just want to say Rick was so gracious to send us uh, some lovely guidebooks like this one right here. Uh, so three lucky uh, viewers of this presentation will be uh, chosen for... Uh, uh, for the guidebook. So we have Rick Steves, Europe Through the Back Door, Rick Steves for the Love of Europe, and Travel is a Political Act. So these are, are wonderful, uh, beautiful books. Uh, I'll be happy to send your way if you're chosen as the lucky winner. So let's go ahead and get started. Less of me, more of Rick. So Rick, we started to get into this. Uh, talk about why is it that we travel or why should we travel? What should we be looking to get out of the experience? Well, that what we just watched there, Steve, was a little three and a half minute clip, which is the last part of a half hour program I made during COVID called Why We Travel. And, you know, I've been teaching travel all my adult life. It's basically all I've ever done since I got out of school. And um, I didn't have a big plan. But back in the 1980s, I was just teaching cheap tricks, budget travel tips. Then in the 90s, I thought, well, you know, we've got We've got uh, the basic skills. Let's travel to enjoy and experience the culture and the art and the history. So I was teaching about that. And then since 9-11, I find really what I like to teach is the, the, the value of travel to broaden our perspectives. The whole notion that, you know, culture shock is the growing pains of a broadening perspective. And what we want to do when we travel is get out of our comfort zone and realize we're not the norm and uh, try new things and uh, come home with a better global citizenship, if maybe just a better appreciation of living where we live anyways. But uh, why we travel is to connect. Uh, we're 4% of this planet. There's 96% out there. And I think it's more important than ever as our world becomes globalized, that we travel in a way that we connect. And you know, it's kind of like a Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs. If I look back at those 30 years of travel teaching or three or four decades of travel teaching, first it was the bottom rung, you know, catch the train, pack light, stay safe, get a hotel, get a restaurant. Then it was appreciate the history and the art and the culture and the cuisine. And then the very pinnacle of that Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs would be traveling in a way that that gives us that very best souvenir and that's a broader perspective uh, and empathy for the other 96% of humanity. I just love that idea that when we travel, we connect. When we travel, we become less ethnocentric. And when we travel, we put ourselves in a mindset where we're more likely to want to build bridges and less likely to want to build walls. So, you know, those are, that's why I travel. And I just love my little niche in helping America travel better, more experientially. And uh, my mission in my company, I employ here 100 people at Rick Steves Europe in Edmonds, about a half an hour north of Seattle. And our mission is to inspire and equip Americans to venture beyond Orlando. We like to joke that it's just important. You can go to Orlando four or five times, but then consider Portugal. The world's an amazing place. And, and I just, I love exploring it. So in thinking through, okay, we're gonna break out of going to Orlando or something domestically based and, and go overseas to Europe or somewhere else exotic. And what is it that we really should be focused on trying to experience? Because I think it's very easy to get in the mindset of, I go to the bookstore, I get a guidebook, either I get yours or somebody else's, and it's very uh, destinationally focused on, I need to hit this attraction and this one and this one, and maybe I'm better to slow down and take a breath and just let the energy just take me somewhere. 
Yeah, you know, Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world, Steve, and we're routinely trying to do everything, you know, and it's very important to realize that um, if you have a good trip, you'll go back. So don't try to see everything. It's a blessing not to see everything. You don't want to exhaust Paris of what it has to offer. Do what you can see. Uh, you see that your time is, is a limited resource, um, just like our money and you got to use your time smartly. Sometimes when you consider the value of your time, getting into a taxi is a good budget trick because you're saving half an hour of messing around with a bus uh, and it's costing you $3 more to get a taxi ride than a bus ticket. So, uh, you know, sometimes a, a, a splurge is good for your time and therefore a very good investment. I think what um, distinguishes a good trip is how many people do you meet? When I'm leading one of our tours, a big part of our business. We took 30,000 people on 1,500 tours in 2019. Our mission was to connect our travelers with people. That's what carbonates the experience. Um, you don't want to just see tired cliches on stage and hang out with other Americans and go back to your hotel and talk baseball. That's not why you travel to some faraway land. I should say my beat is Europe, by the way, so I'll be talking about Europe, but it could be anywhere. But uh, the mark of a good trip for me, if I'm making a TV show, for public television, if I'm leading one of my tours, if I'm researching a guidebook, or just going on vacation with my family, the mark of a good experience is how many people do we meet, not how many things do we check off of our bucket list. Uh, I mentioned experience. That's a trendy thing these days. People want real experiences where you roll your sleeves up and you get your fingers dirty in the local culture. I just love that. <laughs> I just love having experiences. And that's what people are looking for these days when they travel. So use your time smartly, find a way to meet the people and make it experiential. So speaking for yourself, talk to, talk about how your, your love of travel came about and, and what formative experiences you had. It seemed like from reading about your background, uh, that started at a pretty young age and then you got the, the love and the thirst for, for more from, from going on your first trip. You know, I often wonder, had my father not decided to import pianos, would I ever even have had a passport? I don't know what percent of our society has no passport, but it's probably at least half. Why do I have a passport? Well, just by dumb luck, uh, my dad was a piano tuner and he decided to import pianos from Germany. And he came home one day after work and he said, son, we're going to Europe to see the piano factories. I thought, Dad, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> and he, but I, you know, I, I went along. I was a 14 year old with a bad attitude. And uh, on about day two, it occurred to me, you know, this is actually quite interesting. There was different candy, different pop. Uh, there was one armed bandits in the hotel lobbies. I could gamble. Uh, I distinctly remember statuesque German women with hairy armpits. It was a wonderland for this 14 year old kid. And uh, a couple of years later, I was with my parents again, going between the piano factories in Germany and the relatives up in Norway. I was in the Copenhagen train station. And I saw kids a couple years older than me without parents. And Europe was their playground. Exciting destinations clicking up on the reader board. <laughs> Copenhagen, <laughs> Berlin, <laughs> Amsterdam. And I thought, I don't need my parents for this. I could be free as the wind like those kids. Just give me a year rail pass and a few dollars and I'm going to make Europe my playground. So I, went, I vowed to go back to Europe every year. I have. Uh, at first, I was just doing it for kicks. Uh, I, was a, I was a piano teacher back then, and kids wouldn't practice in the summer, so I thought, I'm not going to fight with this. I'll see you in September. I'm going to Europe. And I was learning from my mistakes, and I saw other people learning, uh, making the same mistakes I had made the previous year, and I thought, if I could just package the lessons I've learned from my mistakes into a talk or a guidebook or something, I could teach other people to learn from my mistakes rather than their own. They could have a better trip, and I'd have a good excuse to go back to Europe every year and update my material. So that's what I've been doing for the well, ever since I was a kid. And I've got the same exact mission now that I had back in the 70s when I started my business. The difference is I've got technology beyond my wildest dreams to amplify my teaching. And I've got 100 wonderful uh, colleagues that I work with at Rick Steves Europe. And we're just helping Americans learn from our experience rather than their own and enjoy maximum travel thrills for mile, minute, and dollars. So, you know, I measure my profit as a businessman, not by how many dollars do I make, but how many trips do we impact and uh, we do that with all of our energy, and it's it's just a lot of fun. That flows nicely. I was going to ask the very next question on my list. Uh, what are the most common mistakes people make other than trying to cram too much into too little time to where you don't really get to enjoy the experience and take a breath? 
take a breath. That is so important. You just got to let the experience breathe. And you don't, you know, we, when we sell tours, it is, you're kind of inclined to, you know, when you write the advertising copy, pack everything into there, but there's only 24 hour hours in a day and seven days in a week, and you just can't do it all. So rather than promising yourself more, have a smart itinerary, very important to have a smart itinerary, an efficient itinerary. There's a, a whole chapter in one of my books on having a smart itinerary, you know, go open jaws, don't fly in and out of the same city, start in one city, fly home from another city and avoid that time and money consuming return to your starting point. Uh, that's just, uh, there's lots of uh, tips you can make about planning a smart itinerary. A series of one night stops is just constantly uprooted and it's a mess. Two nights in a row makes a lot more sense. I would have a long travel day in order to enjoy two nights in a row. Uh, put things in order of cultural uh, scariness. Uh, I, I worry about anybody who's never been out of the United States flying into Istanbul for a look at Turkey. Uh, it's going to be overwhelming. Start in London. And, you know, I mean, London com is, is, is very mild compared to the rest of the Europe. But when you start there, it's, it's quite exciting. And then you go to France, then you go to Italy, and then you finish things off with a flurry in Istanbul. You're delaying places most uh, challenging to the end of your trip. Um, equip yourself with good information and use it. You know, a guidebook is a $20 tool for a $3,000 experience. If it's any good, it'll pay for itself on the shuttle in from the airport. I just think there's a lot of people, penny wise and pound foolish, when it comes to using good information. Um, and uh, I, I just think a lot of people need to realize the more you bring to a city, the more you bring to an experience, the more you bring to a museum, the more you'll get out of it. Understand what you're looking for, know the context. Uh, a little studying, a little bit uh, getting, getting uh, prepped for your trip just by uh, reading and seeing documentaries and whatever makes a huge difference. I'll bring in one of our uh, viewer questions. Rick, thanks for joining us. One of the best parts of your shows is when you spend time with local families and friends. How do you make those connections at so many locations? What will be the best way for us to make those kinds of connections? Yeah, you know, I often wonder, is it realistic? I'm going all around Europe going, oh, just meet the people. And, um, you know, I get to go back year and year. Um, I've, I've got... Um, all sorts of uh, network of guides that I work with and so on. Um, but it is an, a sort of a skill to meet people as you travel. If you're not an extrovert, become one. You know, you just got to strike up conversations. You need to assume that we are just as interesting to those Europeans as they are to us. And they'd love to get to know you. And they're a little more formal than we are. So take advantage of our opportunity to be casual and introduce ourselves. Share your food on a train ride. When you go to a pub, understand if you sit at the table, they'll leave you know, alone. If you sit at the bar, that means I want to have some conversation. Uh, find ways to, to, to book uh, experiences that connect you with people. Uh, I love taking food tours all around Europe because I'm hanging out with a bunch of travelers and a guide who's a, a local foodie. And that's a nice way to meet people. In my TV shows, it seems like I know everywhere. You know, I'm always saying, here's my friend and fellow tour guide, Christina, or my friend and fellow tour guide, Alessandro, my friend and fellow tour guide, Alfio. Well, they're, I'm basically paying them to be my friends. They're local guides. I hire them for a half day or a full day, and you could too. We have an ethic in our television show of never doing anything that you can't do on your own. This is not lifestyles of the rich and envious. This is lifestyles of you and me. I always like to say it's people's travel on people's TV. You need to get those local guides and then they're your friend. And a, a local guide you can book. There's all sorts of great local guides that are, they have a calendar and they're looking to fill up their calendar with work and they're quite affordable. And remember, if you're considering hiring a local guide, remember the good news is that they get cheaper where they're more important. You don't need a guide in London where they're $500 a day. You need a guide in Poland where it's $200 a day or Cuba where it's $100 a day or Turkey, where it's $150 a day. That's where you really want to have a guide. And when you have a guide, they meet you at your hotel, they plan your day to, to, according to your interest and needs. They are your interpreter, your negotiator, your, uh, your historian, your sidekick, your comedian, your everything. I just love having a local guide. That makes a huge difference. So you have a local guide and there are obviously camera people with you when you're you're doing a TV show. How much of an entourage do you have uh, when you're doing a show? And do people find it strange to have these cameras around just filming things uh, yeah. you know, that normally you wouldn't have? 
You know, I do not like an entourage when I'm filming. Sometimes when I'm in a developing world country and filming, you know, everybody wants to be where the action is and you've got six or eight people tagging along with you and it just drives me nuts, frankly. I like a small crew. We are three people, me, the cameraman and the producer. Everybody wears a lot of hats uh, where we can carry all of our gear in one load with our personal belongings. We can fit in one car, we can turn on a dime. Uh, it takes us six days to shoot one of our TV shows that you see on public television. Uh, six days of scrambling. It's really fast by industry standards to do a half hour show in six days. And I just love the creative challenge. I love the collaboration. I love working hard with my guy, with my, my crew. Um, so there's three of us. And then more often than not these days, I hire a local guide to be our fixer and, and a communicator and, and help us out. So uh, four of us is the crew. And um, uh, I just don't like to have a lot of, I like to be under the radar when we're filming. Uh, you know, if we have to bring out the reflector or if we uh, have to do something that requires more, you know, gear, it just makes me more nervous. It gathers a bigger crowd. Uh, we have different cameras. We've got our, our normal big camera, which is the best quality, but sometimes we choose to use our little camera. An SLR type camera now can do broadcast quality video. And that lets us be a little more low key. When you're going you know, through a market with a big camera, you, you, you cause people to tense up. If you got your little camera, you can be more um, candid and get more serendipity. Well, just as uh, was mentioned in one of the questions, we see a lot of connections, a lot of happy people, and it all just seems to happen magically, although it's uh, the real story, I'm sure, is more than that uh, when these shows get put together. But I'm curious uh, of what happens even behind the scenes, or if there have been any brushes with danger, things that um, <laughs> maybe you'd rather not think about that are not going to be part of the show, mm -hmm. um, but yet were you know, part of the real life while you were there. Oh, you know, we got what we call positive... <laughs> Positive serendipity and negative serendipity. You will notice if you look, you, if you looked at all 100 of our episodes on Europe, you'd think it never rains in Europe. You know, um, I've got a pretty strict rule of shooting in the Mediterranean in April or May, and then I'm, I'm in Europe for four months out of the year. Um, I'm in I'm in the Mediterranean April and May. I go home in June, and then I'm north of the Alps July and August. I've done that every year for 30 years until last year because of COVID. Uh, last year I had my first birthday at home in more than 30 years. Um, I'm just in this wonderful rut of working in Europe. I can't remember when I filmed any show in particular, but I know if it was in the Mediterranean area, it would have been in April or May, because that's when I shoot the Mediterranean. I do not want the heat and the crowds of summer in the Mediterranean. And if I'm in the Alps or north of the Alps, then it was shot in July or August. And I would say when you're planning your trip, you don't want the heat in the crowds of summer. It's very crowded and it's very hot in the summer in the Mediterranean area. North of the Alps, you want long days, you want good weather, and you want liveliness. You want crowds, frankly, in Scandinavia and Scotland and so on. So I like peak of peak. I like peak season north of the Alps. Um, so, but as far as things going wrong when we're filming, we've been really fortunate. Uh, we're very careful. I've got very strong crew and I've been Let's see, it takes six days. We've probably shot 150 shows. We've probably had a thousand days of shooting together. I've got two cameramen and the same producer, Simon, in every show. And um, thanks be to God, I have never had an injury or been sick or anything while we're filming. Um, the worst thing that happened is we got a string of rain and we had to leave our cameraman in Switzerland for a few days after the rest of us flew home to get a few sunny shots of the mountains. Um, but uh, you know, it takes us a lot of takes to get a shot right. There's all sorts of crazy things that happen. And uh, every once in a blue moon, we have to not include something in the show that we wanted to shoot because we weren't allowed in with the camera or or uh, it closed down or, you know, some, the weather was terrible or something like that. But uh, we're very careful um, to, you know, the hardest thing is the weather. It's the only thing I really can't control. We just did three shows on the Alps before COVID. And that was... Uh, probably 20 days of shooting. Took a couple days longer than normal because I wanted to give us a buffer if there was bad weather. We did three shows for the greatest of the Alps, an hour and a half in the Alps of Italy, of Austria, of Germany, of Switzerland and France. And what I did was for every stop, I had parts of three days. So if we, it would be very unusual to get three terrible days in a row, but several times we needed all three days to get a couple of hours of blue sky to make those uh, colors pop. You mentioned COVID and not surprisingly, we've had a few uh, viewer submitted questions uh, regarding COVID. So we can get to some of those now. 
Uh, one comment slash question. This is such a treat. How has COVID impacted your travel plans? Any tips for traveling post COVID? Well, COVID, uh, you know, I've been really busy this last 14 months, just keeping my team together. I've got a hundred people on our payroll and we've got no income. So it's, this is a difficult time for a travel business. I'm thankful we've had 30 good years. I can afford a couple of bad years. I think it's ethical for me to stick with my team and keep everybody employed. So we're all together. And, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly not traveling. And I'm, I'm just reminding people to be patient. Uh, patience is not an American forte. It's certainly not a Rick Steves forte, but uh, patience is my middle name lately. I am not chomping at the bit to travel. I'm gonna, I don't wanna fly all the way to Amsterdam and eat dinner in a bubble so I don't get somebody's virus. I wanna wait until we can sit together. And I think with our vaccines now, we are on a glide path to normalcy. It's just important that we all get our vaccine vaccination so we can travel. Um, so uh, as far as traveling during COVID, I would say don't do it. I haven't been on an airplane for more than a year and I don't wanna travel unless I have to. If you have to travel, fine, but just, I'm employing my traveler's mindset, Steve, right here at home. I mean, I'm doing things I never did before. This is God's way of telling us to slow down. It's, it's therapy for a workaholic. It's, a, it's, it's just a lesson that there's more to life than increasing its speed. I've learned how to cook. I've learned how to love dogs. I'm feeding the hummingbirds. I'm playing my, my bugle every night when the sun goes down. I play my piano more than ever. I just love to play after dark and see where the, where the chords go. I, I'm doing things I never did before. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm enjoying this traveler's mindset right here at home. And in fact, I've done a lot of uh, writing on that and interviews on that. And uh, you know, people could, they could go to my website and see all the interviews I've done and so on. But uh, once, once things open up, then we're going to jump back into our travels. Now, what's travel going to be like post-COVID? Well, nobody knows for sure, but my hunch, it's going to be pretty much the way it was before COVID. I think it's going to go back to normalcy. We just got to get that, you know, to get to that herd immunity. Um, what will Europe be like? I, I think there's a pent-up demand. I, I've been at this for 30 or 40 years. When we have something that stops travel, the, the demand does not dissipate. It backs up. And then when the coast is clear, everybody jumps back in and they're traveling again. We've got our guides waiting, standing by in Europe. We've got our hotels booked and our bus drivers standing by. And as we've got 15,000 people's names on our wait list for our tours. As soon as we figure it's reliable and safe and stable to travel, we're going to open the floodgate and be back traveling again. Uh, what will Europe be like? I think it will it probably won't have the crowds that it was dealing with before the pandemic hit. Crowds were really getting to be a ridiculous problem, not just with all the Americans traveling and all the Europeans traveling, but new exciting economies uh, opening up in India and China and so on with suddenly 100 million people in those countries that have enough money and dreams to take them to Europe. That's a huge impact on tourism in Europe. And people from emerging economies all want to go to the same few places, just like you and I would like to go to the Taj Mahal if we went to uh, India and the, the Great Wall if we went to China. That's what people do when they, conversely, when they come to Europe, they all want to see the Leaning Tower and the Eiffel Tower and the, and, and, uh, the Mona Lisa. So those are going to be mobbed with travelers, but there's lots of Europe that's not that crowded. And uh, I think Europe is going to be pretty normal when we get back. You know, I, I'm just social distancing and Rick Steves style travel have nothing to do with each other. I go to Paris to have my cheeks kissed. And I go to Rome to pack into those piazzas and grab my gelato and lick it and stroll down the pedestrian boulevards uh, during the passeggiata or the, the local paseo. I go to um, the pubs in Scotland and Ireland to clink glasses with people who really believe strangers are just friends who've yet to meet. And when I go back to Europe, it's probably going to be, it might be late this year or early next year. Uh, that's what I hope to find. We had one viewer question asking when it's safe to go and, and, and you go to Europe, where's the first place you're going to visit? Well, the first place I'm gonna visit is huddling with all my researchers and then uh, uh, fan out and go to everywhere in Europe and update all my books. We've got 50 guidebooks that cover Europe from top to bottom. And these have been labors of love. We've built up these books over 20 or 30 years. They were the best guidebooks in the business and we had Europe all covered and they were so lovingly updated. And then COVID hit. And uh, I don't know what impact that's going to have on Europe going forward, how many little businesses won't be around still. So we're going to go back to Europe as soon as it is 
normalized enough where our experience will be indicative of what is Europe going to be like for travelers post COVID. And then we're going to sweep through the continent and update all of our guidebooks and find out which little moms and pops are still open and which made it through. I've got a friend who runs a museum here in the United States, and he says a good percent of the museums that have closed during COVID will not open again. And I know that in Europe, there's a lot of little moms and pops, little entrepreneurial ventures. Those are the places I like to feature in my TV shows and visit with my tours and rave about in my guidebooks. Those are the places that are fragile and might not make another extended bout of COVID. So I'm hoping that that will be, that that dimension of Europe will still be strong and alive. And then I hope with my patronage and, and, and my, uh, uh, you know, uh, work that we can help uh, boost their uh, businesses so that that wonderful sort of diversity in the European business community survives. That's really what carbonates the whole experience is finding those little mom and pops. That's what I love from top to bottom in Europe, just like here where I live in the United States. Going back to the idea of the traveler's mindset, uh, until it's safe to go to Europe, we're going to be exploring things in the lovely USA, things that we can drive to or maybe take a short flight. And I know there's not going to be necessarily a Rick Steves West Virginia episode ever ever made, but what, what advice would you have uh, for those who are going to be staying domestically to tap into that traveler's mindset and really make the most of the experience uh, with something closer to home? It's not the super exotic European or Asian vacation that we would like to have, but uh, we can certainly find appreciation for things here. Oh, yeah. Well, I mentioned my guidebooks aren't selling, but my publisher's uh, road trip guidebooks to the United States are selling quite well. And if I was going to be spending some vacation time on the road in the USA, I'd have a good guidebook to help me use my time and spend my miles smartly. Um, I'm not one to ask about where to go in the United States because I just haven't traveled around the United States that much. I love my work so much and I take my responsibility so seriously that I spend 100 days a year every year in Europe, you know, making my material up to date. It's not vacation. I'm over there just uh, slamming around and learning as much as I can, taking careful notes. Uh, when I get ripped off, I celebrate because they don't know who they just ripped off. I'm going to learn that scam and pack it into the, the updated material. But if you're thinking about enjoying the United States, yeah, this is a good time when we can travel to get to know our own neighborhood. Um, and uh, I, I would just say, um, you know, it's right now for me, the priority is for all of us to get a grip on this pandemic. And I don't want to do anything that's going to slow the recovery. What I'm most interested in now is just embracing the science, being thankful for the good governance, and making sure that we take care of people in our communities that are struggling. Uh, there's a lot of hard times during this pandemic, and there's a lot of people who will never see their name on a plane ticket, and they, they only wish they had tours to cancel. Uh, and I want to make sure those, uh, those people are, are doing okay. I think something great about the pandemic potentially is it reminds us of the fragility and the preciousness of our environment. For me, I've been so tuned into the environment now. Every sunset for me is like a, it's, it's like a, a devotional. Uh, the bird sound is just so delightful that I wake up to. I didn't fully appreciate that before. So I guess if I was traveling around the United States, I would travel in a way, in a way that's good for my soul. I think I would work to connect with nature. And that's one thing that the United States uh, really excels in. I'll share a comment first and a, uh, then a question from a viewer. Uh, one person, Andy, writes, I appreciate your honesty on traveling in the pandemic. And uh, here's a question from Jared. Hi, Rick. I loved using your guided tours during my semester abroad. What are some places that you would consider hidden gems in Europe? Well, hidden gems in Europe. I wrote my first book called Europe Through the Back Door in 1980, and it was kind of two books in one. The first half was the skills, and the last half were chapters on my favorite hidden gems, what I called back doors. And I've been searching for back doors ever since. I've got to say that in Europe, it's so well touristed now, it's hard to find back doors. It's hard to find hidden gems. But what I like to do is take my energy for finding those hidden gems and going to places that are well-discovered, Paris, Barcelona, uh, Sicily, uh, the Rhine River, and finding ways to experience and enjoy that in a more intimate and real way, not just following all the tour groups into the theater and watching slap dancing and yodeling on stage and hanging out with other Americans, but turning the other direction and uh, going where the local people go. I think a very important part of my travels is to become I'm almost like a chameleon. I, I almost change physically when I'm traveling. Wherever country I am, 
I will become like a chameleon. I'll change into somebody who lives there. I don't think I've ever made a pot of tea in this hemisphere. I don't get tea. But when I'm in London or in England, a spot of tea after a long day of sightseeing, it just feels right. I like tea in England. I don't drink whiskey here, but when I'm in Scotland, I actually buy a little bottle of whiskey. And every night while I'm in Scotland, I pour a tiny little wee dram of whiskey and I enjoy it. Communing with Scotland. It's just right. When I'm in Ireland, I drink Guinness. When I'm in Czech Republic, I drink these wonderful, wonderful lagers. Um, I don't drink wine in Czech Republic. I drink full-bodied red wine when I'm in Tuscany. I do not drink beer in Tuscany. I, I don't know a lot of Italian words, but I know corposo vino rosso por favore. Full-bodied red wine, please. Uh, I don't ever work hard all day long here in Seattle and come home and crave a glass, a nice cloudy glass of ouzo. But when I'm on the Greek islands, I love a glass of ouzo. I don't let a sunset go down without having my glass of ouzo. So we want to become a temporary local. Uh, when I'm in Italy, I like to go to the, the university towns in Italy and go to the squares, the piazzas where the students hang out, see what they're drinking. They're all drinking this spritz. Uh, it's just like this fluorescent orange colored drink. When the sun is setting, it shines right through those glasses. And it just there's just like these uh, splashes of orange all across the piazza. And I'll join a table of students. I'll buy them a round of the spritzes. And all of a sudden, I'm the most popular kid on the block. And they've got an American friend and uh, we're drinking together and it's a beautiful experience to, to spend 10 bucks to buy four kids, uh, four university students at a table in, in Verona or in, or in Padova, uh, a, a, a drink and spend half an hour hanging out with them. That's one of the best experiences you could have in Italy. And it's not in any guidebook. It's determined by your ability to be a cultural chameleon, to connect. I love that about the temporary local. And uh, although I had a list of questions, we've had so many from the viewers that I'm going to put my list aside and get to as many of these as we can. So this question is from someone who would like to be a temporary local in Iran. Rick, one of your most memorable shows was when you went to Iran. How feasible, legally or practically, is it for an independent traveler to go to Iran? Thank you for that question. And I had a wonderful time in Iran. I went there, um, as I do occasionally with my TV crew, to tackle a complicated issue for caring and smart Americans who are curious and steep on the learning curve. I, I really felt that we Americans know what we know about Iran, people my age anyways, from Ted Koppel and the Iran hostage crisis. And I just thought that was a, a, comedious, a, a media circus. It was just a ridiculous way to assess Iran. And I wanted to go there and meet the people. My friend said, Rick, why are you going to Iran? And I thought, well, it's good style to know people before you bomb them. That's really what I thought. I wanted to know the Iranian people. They're supposed to be my enemies. Why would 70 million people in Iran vote for the government they have, you know? So I went there and I got to know their baggage and their perspective. And it was a beautiful experience. I would love to go back to Iran and I, I hope to someday soon. Um, a lot of Americans think nobody goes to Iran. A lot of Americans think nobody goes to Cuba. Well, not many Americans go to these places because our government doesn't want us to go there, but plenty of people go there as tourists. Lonely Planet has a very good selling guidebook to Iran. Uh, Cuba is the number one Caribbean resort destination for Germans and Canadians. Uh, it's just Americans don't think people go there. No, Americans don't go, but, but everybody else does. We've just got this hang up because they're supposed to be our enemies. I, when, I, when my government says I can't go somewhere, I want to go there and check it out. So what is the legality of going to Iran? I don't know what it is right now, but in my experience, unless there's a war on the uh, brewing, uh, in my experience, uh, tourism is wide open. You've just got to have a land operator in Iran paved the way for you. It's like traveling the Soviet Union in the old days. You couldn't go there unless you took a tour. They want to know where all the foreigners are. They'd love your money from the West. They'd love to show you off their, all their good stuff. But they want you to be with a guide and they want to know where you're going to be every night. So that means you got to take a tour to go to Iran. Now you take the tour. It doesn't need to be expensive. There's lots of agents in the United States that have connections in Iran. And all they do is sell to Americans tours that already exist in Iran. And they connect you with that. You fly in, they meet you at the airport, they take you to the hotel and you're on that group. It could be a private tour that you could book just for you and your, your travel partner. Or it could be an existing tour. Point is, you'll have a guide with you all the time. 
that guide could, you could ask the guide just to sit down and have a cup of tea. You want to explore on your own and, and have a little freedom like that. But I found our guide, who is kind of a minder slash guide, was a real blessing. I'm glad we were with him. I didn't want to go find their nuclear power plants and I didn't really want to get involved in the way they treat uh, the Baha'is or something like that. I just wanted to be a tourist and figure out who they are and, um, you know, in, enjoy a little time with them. And we had the time of our life. If you haven't seen my Iran show, check it out. You can see any show we've ever produced for free anytime. If you just go to ricksteves.com, go to the TV section and click on uh, whatever show you like. But uh, the Iran show did it a while ago. It's still very, very timely. You could look at it now, and I think it's just as timely now as it was a decade ago when we made it. The same thing with my, my visit to the Holy Land. We went to Israel and Palestine, and I really believe strongly if you're going to go to the Holy Land, you really haven't gotten a, a fair look at it unless you have a dual narrative approach to that complicated piece of real estate. You need to have people on both sides of the wall give you their perspective in order for you to have any idea of what's the truth. Rick, how would you advise a woman traveling alone as opposed to a man uh, going on his own? Well, that's kind of complicated for me to answer because I'm a man and I've never had the experience of a woman traveling alone, but I've been asked that question for 30 or 40 years and I've been taking women on tours for that period and half of my staff are great women travelers and I'll share you my thoughts on that. Uh, the issue is um, how are women respected in that particular country and how safe is it in a particular country? Uh, I would say safety is not something anybody can answer for somebody else. It's just, what are you comfortable with? Some people, some women are not comfortable in an American big city after dark. Well, that's fine. That's your assessment. You're probably not going to be comfortable in a big European city after dark. But if you would be comfortable in Albany, if you'd be comfortable in Cleveland, if you'd be comfortable in in uh, you know Santa Fe or San Francisco or or Dallas after dark, you would be comfortable in any big city after dark in Europe if you just used common street sense. Um, so, in fact, I think Europe is safer for women than the United States is. It's safer. Period. Uh, you, you're very likely to get pickpocketed or purse snatched. That's very likely in Europe because thieves target Americans, not because they're mean, but because they're smart. It's just common sense if you're a street thief in Europe to target Americans, because we've got all the good stuff in our purses and wallets, and Europeans are more streetwise than that. But uh, you're not going to get mugged or knifed in Europe, that's for sure. The other issue is, are women expect uh, respected I I on the streets in Europe? And that's another uh, question that it depends on, really, it depends on the woman. Um, but there is this macho sort of thing in the South where there's cat calls and people staring at women and, and not respecting women. Women a lot of times feel invisible in the South of Europe as everything revolves around the men. If you don't like that, you know, go to Scandinavia and, and you'll feel much better or go to the Netherlands or something like that. Um, but in the South, women are, are um, well, it's a macho culture and, and women uh, are not as respected on the, out in public. Um, but I don't think that's a safety issue. I think that's a cultural issue. Uh, women who are traveling need to be wise about what kind of signals they're sending out. I've found uh, that if a woman gets a lot of eye contact, if she talks about you know meaningful things, uh, if she's dressing very exciting, if she's walking around after dark uh, alone, those are misunderstood and people get the wrong message and that woman will have to deal with that. Um, so stick to po populated areas. Don't get a lot of eye contact. A lot of European women, when they're out and about after dark, they hold hands with each other. Two women holding hands walking down the street. They're not pretending to be gay or anything like that. It's just a sign to men that we're not out on the prowl and don't bother hustling us. Next question from our viewer. I'd like to travel with small groups with allowance for free time to get away from the tourist areas and see where people live. I've had some great experiences. As I get older, I'm hesitant to travel totally on my own, though I'm fine spending some time by myself. So do you have any recommendations for tours which allow more time in a city and are more relaxed? Well, um, that's, you know, that's the main part of my business. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we took 1,500 tours to Europe in 2019. It was our best year ever. 30,000 Americans, half of those people were return customers, many of them. They sent us an email to start out with by saying, I'm not a tour type person, but 
I've heard your tours of this and that and so on. And we, we are independent minded travelers that, that really artfully take advantage of the economy and efficiency of group travel, sharing a bus, having great local guides, making reservations in advance. And we have something called orient and disperse. We do what you should do as a group together and we make time so people can get out and do their own things. So that's the philosophy of our tour company. And we actually have a kind of tour company, a kind of tour within our 40 itineraries that we offer that I think takes it even a step further. They're called My Way Tours. And a My Way Tour is less expensive and it doesn't come with a guide. It comes with a, a coordinator and it has the same bus itinerary, the same hotels and all the breakfasts and then the, 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 the coach is in the hotel in the morning with office hours to help you sort out your plans and so on. And you got your Rick Steves guidebook and you do your own thing all day long. And then you don't have to worry about driving. You don't have to worry about hotels. You got plenty of friends if you want them or if you don't, you can just pick or choose. And that's called a My Way Tour. So that works quite well. Uh, but you know, you can find the philosophy of different tours. I'll just say, if you're an independent type traveler, and you take a typical inexpensive bus tour, you got to remember the cheapest bus tours are not cheaper. They've just not yet made their money. They're going to, they're hell bent on making money off of you once you get over there. And part of their uh, modus operandi is to save money by parking you outside of town at a hotel where you have no option but to pay $75 to get back on the bus for that optional tour of downtown. I just really find that uh, almost deceiving. Uh, you know, you've got to realize that uh, some tours, you pay for everything up front. Other tours, they get you in the door and then they keep you in the dark and they make money off you left and right through your whole vacation. I don't like, I started my tour company back when I was a kid um, because I didn't like that philosophy. With our tours, we pay extra to keep our groups right downtown. So you can get up early and take a walk and you can go for a walk after dinner and our hotel's right where the action is. Uh, it costs more and you don't have that trapped tourist situation where they have to take your optional sightseeing. Our sightseeing tours are included anyway, so it's not an issue. But a typical big bus tour company would never keep you downtown because the hotels cost more. They're more funky because they're old buildings and they're gonna have more complaints because the elevators don't work or the air conditioning's kind of quirky. Uh, and they'd rather keep you um, together in a hotel outside of town so you have to pay for the extra tours. Read the fine print carefully. If the brochure says you're gonna sleep in the Venice area, remember that could be halfway to Bologna. You wanna sleep right downtown so you're free to get out and do your own thing. Here's a, a situation that comes up in, in many families one person is really charged up and wants to travel and other people in the family are a little bit skittish and reluctant. How do you manage a situation like that? You know, I like cruises for one reason, because you could have three generations of a family together on a cruise ship and they'd have their great time together in the evenings when the, when the ship's sailing. And every day, everybody gets to, ch to choose what they want to do. You know, grandma and grandpa can just sit poolside. Uh, the kids can go crazy and mom and dad can go to that museum. <laughs> That's a good thing. And then every night you get back together again. So a cruise is, for me, it's not great travel, but it's a very great vacation. It's, it's, I think it's safe. I think it's economic. It's certainly efficient. You only move into one hotel and you just every night you travel and you have a different city. I'm not big into river cruises because a river is usually a similar culture all the way down. I like a Mediterranean cruise or a North European cruise because every day you're in a different country, a different language group, a different culture. Uh, and then um, I find that on a cruise ship, you got 3,000 tourists usually. Uh, I'd say 1,000 of them are not travelers at all. They're just uh, looking for a floating alternative to Las Vegas. Uh, 1,000 of them would be bucket shop type travelers. Just they want to see all these things so they can check it off their bucket list before they die and they better hurry up. And one third of them are actually travelers that like moving into one hotel and they're the first people to hit the ground after that gangplank hits the dock. And they're eight hours without seeing another person from the cruise ship doing their own thing in Naples or Barcelona or Ephesus or wherever they end up going. That is fun. And that's, I've written a guidebook for that and I really, I really enjoy that. So that would be helpful. I would say if you've got seniors that you're traveling with, I'll remind you the most grueling thing about European travel is the heat and the crowds of summer. So bundle up and go shoulder season. That helps a lot. If you're traveling with kids or if you're traveling with people that don't walk well, it's nice to have your own, own wheels. You do a lot of walking and especially if you don't have your own car, you're gonna do a lot of walking. 
Sticking with the topic of cruises, a question from one of our, of our viewers. Are you going to be updating the cruise line related to guidebooks given COVID's impact on cruises? <laughs> We've loved your Mediterranean cruise book. We just bought your Baltic one when COVID hit. Frown face, we hope to cruise again. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to be an expert on COVID. Uh, I think COVID's going to be a transitory thing or a transitional thing. And when we get into post-COVID, um, I, I just think everybody's going to be able to assess the, the safety of travel. And I can't imagine cruise ships are going to be sailing if it's still dangerous. Everything comes with a little bit of a risk. I mean, there's people all wigging out over uh, one of the vaccines because less than one person in a million, you know, gets blood clots from it. Uh, uh, and then they end up not getting a shot. And I mean, the uh, lack of wisdom in that is kind of obvious. You've got a much greater shot, ch a chance of dying by not taking your chance than one in a million of getting blood cuts by taking your uh, vaccine. So, you know, you got to be your own uh, judge of risk. But uh, I would say a, a cruise ship to me is a, a great way to travel. We'll be updating our cruise book and it really works well for people because it's designed for that one third of the of the passengers who really want to travel. And I don't really give you tips on how to eat well on a cruise ship or which cruise ship has the better staterooms. This book is your manual for using your time smartly when you're on terra firma, when you have time on shore. If you have that guidebook, you know what to do and you don't need to spend a hundred bucks uh, every time you land by barreling under the big bus with all the other cruisers, you can be independent. And that's a good thing. One thing, by the way, I would remind people if they're cruising, for what four people would spend taking the bus excursion, you could hire your own private guide with a car or a minibus to meet you at the port. And then you've got this intimacy, your own guide, your own wheels, and it's a beautiful luxury. And it's not that expensive. That's very easy to do just by partnering with a local guide. And there's a whole mini industry of, of uh, small time operators that kind of just kind of like bottom feeders, you know, um, earning their living off of uh, little bits and pieces of the cruise industry. Going back to talking about uh, local guides, a uh, question that came in, these are coming in so fast, I have to scroll and, and find things and then it refreshes. I have to start over. How does one know which guides are trustworthy and safe? Well, when I go to Europe for 100 days, a third of the time is working on my tour program. A third of the time is making TV shows. And a third of the time is researching my guidebooks. When I'm researching my guidebooks, I'm alone. And I would say every day I have at least one guide. And more often than not, it's a guide I don't know. I just book the guide off the internet, from the tourist office, through TripAdvisor, whatever. I'll book the guide. I've never had an experience where I booked a dangerous guide. I've had mediocre guides. I've had a rare occasion with a bad guide, but that's very rare. And I've had great guides. Last, uh, last time I was in Europe, 2019, I probably had 50 guides. And I would bet 25 of them were good enough to earn a spot in my guidebook. So they would be in my guidebook with their email address and so on. All of them were worth the time and the money. And 25 of them, half of them were worth recommending. The question is, how do you get a good guide? There's a company called um, Tours by Locals. It's a web matching service. And they take a pretty good cut. And I find they're a little bit more bureaucratic than they should be, but I've used them and it's pretty good. They've got good quality guides. And if you're in an organization like that, you got to be good because if you get a bad record, they'll stop uh, associating with you. Um, I, uh, If you like my guidebooks, uh, my guidebooks are filled with recommendations of guides who are friends of mine that I, I visit with every time I'm in town. And they're hardworking, independent guides. They just love to teach. They're beautiful people. If you want to know about guides, um, I've got 100 guides in Europe right now, and I'm not able to offer them any work. Many of them rely primarily on me for their livelihood with the 1,500 tours we do every year on a normal tour. Right now, I'm just, I'm not, there's no way we're going to make any money. I'm just being a hub to try to connect my travelers with my guides who are out of work, and my guides are not even trying to make money. They just want to teach. So it's called the Guides Marketplace, and I must have 50 or 60 of my guides doing creative things there. And what it is, it's just a list of guides in every country in Europe, and they're offering cooking lessons, language lessons, music, art, virtual tours, much of it, most of it for free. And we're just providing this landing site, this hub. It's called the Rick Steves Guides Marketplace. You can meet a lot of guides there, and all of them, 
would be happy to book with you a private time in their city for half a day or for a full day, or you could book them for a three-day excursion. You know, you could have your own private tour. Uh, but uh, one thing I would recommend if you're searching for a guide is to remember, I'm not a big fan of TripAdvisor when it comes to eating and sleeping recommendations, but I love TripAdvisor for things to do. That's the third stool of the information they provide. And a big part of things to do is that just lists every little business in Salzburg or Edinburgh or Dublin or Galway or whatever town you're talking about. You look in TripAdvisor and there's going to be in Salzburg 60 little businesses, five companies that are doing Sound of Music tours three companies that are doing schnapps tastings. You got bike tours up and down the river. You got food tours. You've got history walks. You've got architecture. You got all sorts of stuff. And uh, you've got a lot of people that are just hardworking private guides and they are invisible if they're not in TripAdvisor. So they find a way to get in TripAdvisor. They present themselves as a big company, but it's really just one person who's a tour company and you can read the feedback and see how they are and you can book them. But that's a wonderful resource for finding a local guide anywhere on this planet. And the cool thing about TripAdvisor is you're working direct person to person, which I like very much. I have a feeling this may be a, a long list, but what are some places you would consider must-sees? And then also kind of going the other way, what are places that yeah, we should skip it because maybe to you it seemed like oh, I was really looking forward to this, and then it, it kind of didn't really live up to live up to the hype. Steve, I've got to plug my book for the love of Europe. This is the book I wrote just before the pandemic hit, and it is my must sees. So if people want to know what are the must sees, there you go. This is a hundred essays on my hundred favorite places and experiences, and it's just. I, I had to call out all the guidebook stuff. There's no hours and prices and practical tips for, you know, avoid the crowds by going on Tuesday. It's just the experience. It's fun to read this. Uh, I know it's fun to read it because I just recorded the audio version of it and I was stuck in a hot, sweaty recording booth for six days and I loved it. I was so into each of these places. I just love them. But that would be my collection of favorite places. Also, um, sorry for just, it's just kind of a, a plug, but... In free information is, is what I do. And my TV shows are absolutely free. There's 150 of them on my website. And if you wondered, what's my favorite place in Portugal? What's my favorite place in Norway? What about Estonia? You know, there's a TV show for you and it gives you a nice half hour package on what I'd like to do. It comes with a script. And with every place we visit, you've got a link so you can visit that place online and it's totally free. So, um, you know, think about slicing Europe into 120 half an hour episodes. There's two on Norway, there's four on Ireland, there's eight on Spain, and there's 18 on Italy. That's nine hours of Italy. So if you wonder what's my favorite place, I don't, well, I, you could derive it from where have I done the most TV shows, Italy, 18, Ireland, four. Um, but um, my favorite places in any any area there, I, lo I love so much in Europe. I mean, I love Hamburg. I love Belfast. I love Bergen. I love Athens. I love Idra. I, <laughs> I love Sicily. I love cannoli. Um, and, uh, you know, it's all there in the, uh, the TV shows. So, I mean, that's what I'd recommend. What tips would you have for a young traveler who's uh, on a tight budget? If you're a young traveler on a tight budget, I love the big once over lightly of all of Europe. It's the, you know, the grand tour, the whirlwind tour. I would get a two month year rail pass and uh, I'd hit the road. The year rail pass, uh, you know, it's not that popular these days because people have shorter vacations and they don't want to go all over creation. But the best trip I ever had in Europe was that early two month year rail trip where I just did all the famous places. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can cover a lot of ground. Um, if, you're, if you don't have a lot of money, what you want to do is avoid hotels and restaurants. Stay in a youth hostel and cook for the price of groceries. When you stay in a youth hostel, you've got, you're paying for a dorm bed instead of a room. That's far, far cheaper. You've got a, 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 a kitchen where you can cook for the price of groceries. And you got a circle of friends. You got a lounge. You got you know game boards. You got all sorts of free activities. You got people you can team up with and have a wonderful time. Uh, I, I go to youth hostels even when I'm by far the oldest person at the youth hostel. It's just in so many ways, it's more than a cheap alternative. It's a way to have friends and it's a way to get close to the ground. So youth hosteling is, is really important. Any recommendations on best places uh, for families, particularly with uh, younger children? 
Well, if people have really little children and they ask me where they should go, I say to grandma and grandpa's on the way to the airport. I mean, it's expensive to take little kids to Europe. And if you don't have a lot of money and if you got a lot of things you want to see and do, uh, a mom and a dad take a huge hit in what they can accomplish and their trip costs a lot more by having a little kid with them in Europe. Having said that, we took our kids to Europe every year for the first 18 years of their life and uh, no regrets. It's wonderful parenting if you can take your kids to Europe. Older kids, um, it becomes a good value. I mean, older kids, I just love what we were able to share and experience uh, uh, with our kids when they got you know 12 or 14 years old. Um, uh, different itineraries make more sense for kids. You know, my, my, their, their mother is Irish, my family's Norwegian. So, uh, you know, we went to Ireland and it was family heritage. That was wonderful. And Dublin's such a sweet town that kids can have a big city thrill without getting in trouble. I really liked that. Uh, on the west coast of, Dub of Ireland, kids go into the pubs and they're playing pool with people twice their age. They're, they're not old enough to drink, but they're old enough to be part of the community in that pub. One year we did a trip that was from Vienna to Zurich doing all the things that you do in the mountains and the Alps. That was a wonderful trip. Another trip we did Venice and the Cinque Terre, just for a fun look at, at Italy without cars. I mean, Venice is wonderful and the Cinque Terre is your best bit of the Mediterranean anywhere. Uh, you can have a lot of fun with your kids in Europe, that's for sure. But, you know, a little thoughtfulness helps the trip go smoother and, and more efficiently. Well, let's just say we get grandma and grandpa to uh, do us a favor and take the kids for a week and we could do the couple's trip to Europe. What places yeah. would you especially recommend? Oh, I can't say. I mean, it's just, I'm really impressed by how much I just love wherever I am in Europe. I mean, there's places that I, I don't really like and I don't go back. I've checked them out and people don't go there anyways. But um, I would say, remember, study before your trip to understand what, where really are your travel dreams? I mean, if you're thinking of this meandering river with, with kind of corduroy green hills of vineyards, and ruined castles and half-timbered villages at the foot of the castle and, and ferries going up and down the river. You might think that's the Rhine River, but no, that's the little sister of the Rhine River that comes into the Rhine at the town of Koblenz. That's the Mosul River. So most people, when they think of the Rhine, they're thinking of the Mosul. Uh, a lot of people, when they go to the fjords of Norway, they think of Geringer. Well, Geringer is so famous, I think, because it's on the cruise uh, list. You know, So a lot of people talk about Geringer. But there's other fjords that are nicer than Geringer. Geringer is the one that really accommodates the cruise ships well. So what is the best of Europe? It really depends on what you want to do. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I can't tell you. I mean, I was in Romania recently, and there's a part of Romania which is like an open-air folk museum. Mara Marish, it's called, up in the north right next to the Ukraine or Ukraine, and I had never known about Mar Marsh until just a couple years ago. Just a couple years ago, I was hiking around Mount Blanc. There's a 100-mile, 10-day hike around Mount Blanc, the highest mountain in Europe, taller than Mount Rainier, 15,000 feet. Every night, you sleep in a rustic mountain lodge. Every night, they serve you a dinner. There's no menu. You eat whatever's cooking. It's, it's rustic, high cuisine. High cuisine as an opposed of altitude. You're hiking through Italy, Switzerland and France with people from around Europe who just love nature. Every morning you put your bag into a van and it drives your van to the next mountain lodge ha! and you hike just with your day bag. That was a beautiful trip. And uh, uh, I just was faking it with my TV crew. We were producing a TV show, but I want to go back there and do the whole hike. That would be a beautiful thing. Um, I never get tired of Paris. I think my favorite city might be Rome. Uh, I love Copenhagen. Can't get enough of Lisbon. I'm sorry, I can't tell you where you got to go on your trip, uh, but I, I could say that uh, it behooves you to do a little study ahead of time so you might realize that, oh, I never even considered of the great cities of Andalusia, Sevilla, Cordoba, and Granada. That'd be a cool trip with a little side trip into Morocco. Ha! It's just an hour boat ride from, from southern Spain over at Gibraltar over to Morocco, and then you'd spice things up with a trip into Africa. There's a lifetime of travel thrills that you could enjoy and I can just hardly wait to get back. Back to talking about TripAdvisor. If you don't use or recommend TripAdvisor for hotels, do you recommend another online source or aggregator? Hmm. No, I just use a Rick Steves guidebook. <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've just been studying these guidebooks and working on these guidebooks for ever since my first book was published in 1980. And I don't really uh, want to go to a big fancy high-rise hotel that has uh, relationships with airlines and aggregators. 
um, I just want a funky little guest house, a little bed and breakfast, a little pension. And I like to find a guidebook. Doesn't have to be my guidebook, but some guidebook that really knows your values of travel and that can match you with that kind of a hotel. Having said that, you know, you can always go online and use some crowdsourcing information. But my problem with TripAdvisor is everybody is an is a overnight expert. I mean, people who have never been to Paris say this is the best chocolate in town. You know, they say these crepes are to die for. How do they know? <laughs> it's generally bad information. When I'm in Paris, I notice all the tourists, all the Americans are hell-bent on eating at this one Tex-Mex restaurant. Why are you eating at a Tex-Mex restaurant in Paris? Well, it's number one on TripAdvisor. It must be good. You know, we're trying to get herd immunity with our vaccinations. Well, we've already got herd mentality when it comes to this culture of everybody doing what everybody else is doing. It's that Instagram thing. Why is that big pile of people there lining up to stand on that stump to get a picture of them with the Matterhorn behind them? Oh, it's what you do for, uh, uh, in, for uh, Instagram, you know, uh, all this so social media kind of follow the leader stuff. Um, I'm, I'm just not into that. Um, yeah, you're coming into a town, you could, you could Google it and see what restaurant, what hotels are available. Um, but you know, the only times I've really had are the, the, the most memorable bad experiences I've had in hotels are booking hotels through a desperate kind of web search where you just see what's the price and, and what's available and where is it. I mean, that's where you have, have trouble. Um, I would rather plan my trip properly with a good guidebook and book hotels that are vetted by a trusted guidebook writer. That's what works for me. We'll take one or two more questions quickly and they're starting to slow down and I think that would be probably a natural place to, to wrap it up for tonight. How do you shop and send back to the United States larger souvenirs? Uh, I stopped buying souvenirs a long time ago. I, I buy, I take photographs and I, I write down memories. I'm always traveling with a little notebook and writing down memories. Um, and uh, I just don't have much appetite for physical things. Uh, but having said that, I, I, did, I went through that phase and a lot of travelers love to buy things and, and send them home. You got a choice, three choices. You can buy it and carry it with you. You can buy it and take it yourself to the post office and mail it home. Or you can buy it from a merchant that is prepared to mail it home for you. I think if the merchant is prepared to mail it home for you, he can take care of the duty concerns. He can wrap it safely and you get it home. If you go to the, uh, I've got a wonderful set of uh, crystal from a great uh, uh, glass shop in uh, in Dingle in Southwest Ireland. And I just fell in love with this set. And um, they were very good at putting it in a box and safely. And I got my crystal home in one piece. That would be a smart way to do that. So uh, I would not in, be inclined to buy a lot of souvenirs. If I did, I wouldn't want to carry them around. I'd find a way to mail them home. And if the merchant does it, that would be my choice. Many places in Europe are being discovered as information is easier to share online. And that sort of ties, I think, into what you said earlier about places being just, especially in the Mediterranean, being becoming very, very crowded for uh, people from everywhere. So yeah. the question, uh, which places should people see before they change too quickly? I think you missed your opportunity. <laughs> I think it's already changed. Uh, you know, I would just say you can go to famous places, but you can go to famous places and see and experiencing them in a way that's not inundated by the crowds. There are plenty of ways to connect with Paris, Barcelona, Amsterdam, Venice, Salzburg, Florence, these cities that are just notorious for being crowded. Also, second cities. Think about second cities. Everybody goes to Edinburgh. Why not Glasgow? Everybody goes to Dublin. Why not Belfast? Everybody goes to Paris. Why not Lyon or Marseille? Everybody goes to Munich. Why not Hamburg? There's a lot of second cities. I mean, you got to see Edinburgh, but you could actually do the main things in Edinburgh and hang out in Glasgow. Uh, I was just in Bath. Bath is a wonderful town. I love Bath. It's the cutest town in England. I've been going there every, every time I'm in England. I go there to update my chapter on Bath. It's two hours west of London. 20 minutes away from Basque is an amazing city called Bristol. It's a real city with a real maritime heritage. I'd never been there. I went there just before COVID hit and it was, oh, it was such a beautiful experience. It was a second city. It was a former industrial kind of rust belt city that now is feeling its energy. The cool thing about second cities is they were industrial cities rather than elegant cities. You know, uh, and uh, they say, uh, 
what is the saying in, in Scotland? They say a, a, a funeral in Glasgow is more fun than a wedding in Edinburgh. You know, uh, well, that kind of speaks volumes about what the two cities are like. Uh, it's a working class town. It's ready to have a beer and have a lot of fun. Uh, I would just think you want to find those rust belt cities, those industrial former wastelands that now are thriving and they're filled with with a wonderful street art and happening little foodie gourmet restaurants and small boutique re hotels. There's a lot of fun to be had that way. So, um, uh, but don't worry about what are the most important places you should see. Uh, Europe is a lifetime of things you can see. And I would just say, bite it off little chunks at a time, do your study and have a great time. That's great. Well, before we wrap it up for tonight, I just wanted to uh, thank a few colleagues in the alumni engagement office who were very helpful in getting this event put together. I'm the one on camera and I don't want to look like I'm taking all the credit. So just want to thank Jen Gabriel, Alicia Loso, Megan Borovica, and Hugh Weigmans uh, for their help in putting uh, tonight's event together. So couldn't do this without you and couldn't do it without Rick Steves. So uh, we can give a, a virtual round of applause to Rick. Thank you so much. And as I've been looking at the comments and questions come in during the hour, certainly uh, plenty of compliments for the work that you do and, and, and very uh, grateful that you're with us tonight and for the information you've shared. And uh, as I said, pleased to have you as part of the Binghamton family for, for one evening. So thank you very much for being part of this and, and, and being with us. Well, thank you, Steve. And it's been a delight. Those were great questions. I, I wish I could offer more help. I, I want to remind people that uh, we've got a lot of information for free on our website. Uh, we've got a corner called Classroom Europe, which is designed for teachers, which takes our 150 TV shows and breaks it into 500 little teachable clips. And you can assemble them in any playlist you like. It's free. It's fun. There's no ads in it. Uh, we've got all of our shows available. Uh, we've got every Monday, we have a big party called Monday Night Travel, and that's free. And we're just having a good time keeping people's travel dreams alive as we wait for the time when we can all travel again. So thank you so much for having me. And I'd like to wish everybody happy travels, even if we're just staying home for a little while longer. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We appreciate you being here with us and hope that you found this to be engaging and informative. And we'll see you next time on the Binghamton Learning Network. Have a good night and thank you.